Welcome to Discrete Differential Geometry. Today we're going to talk about geodesics. So at a very high level, geodesics kind of generalize the idea of straight lines to curved spaces. And today we're going to look at geodesics from both smooth and discrete points of view. Um, and although we'll use a little bit of the knowledge we already have about smooth surfaces, actually geodesics are pretty easy to understand if we look at them from the discrete point of view. Okay, so again, the basic idea is to generalize the notion of lines to curved spaces. What do we mean by that? What do we know about lines? Well, ordinary lines in the plane, for instance, have two basic features. For one thing, they are kind of straightest curves. As we go along the line, there's no curvature, there's no acceleration in one direction or the other. We just go straight. We can even imagine we go straight at a constant velocity, perhaps. Lines are also shortest in some sense, or we might say they locally minimize length. So if I take two points on the line, and I consider any other possible way of connecting these two points, I find that the straight segment that I already had is really the shortest way of doing it. Geodesics on curved spaces are going to share these same basic local properties, even though they might exhibit very different and interesting behavior globally. Okay, but those are our key ideas about geodesics. Geodesics are both straightest and shortest, or at least locally shortest. And in fact, geodesics are interesting because they're sort of part of the origin story of both classical and differential geometry. So if we go back to Euclid, who was one of the first people to try understanding geometry in a rigorous way, he said, okay, I'm going to write down five basic postulates, basic things that I think geometry should satisfy that seem self-evident, and then try to prove everything else that we know about geometry, starting from only those basic postulates. What were those postulates? Well, one said, if I have two points in the plane, for instance, then they can be connected by a straight line segment seems pretty hard to argue with. Second, any straight segment can be extended into a complete line. Okay. Third, for any segment, there's a circle centered at one endpoint and having the segment as its radius. Fourth, all right angles are congruent. Now I have to admit, for me, this was a little bit mysterious when I first read it. What does this mean, all right angles are congruent? I mean, of course, all 90 degree angles are the same. So what did Euclid really mean here? Well, a good question to ask first is, what is a right angle? And for Euclid, a right angle means if I take two lines and find their point of intersection, and then I measure the angles that those lines make, then if all four angles are equal, I call them right angles. And what Euclid is saying here is that if I do this again at some other point of the plane, and I again find four equal angles, then those four angles are the same size as the angles I had before. Another way of saying this is I have the same total angle around any given point in the plane. Now, that might seem a little bit obvious, but remember the whole point here is to write down things that we all agree on, that there's no debate about whether it's true. And it's also interesting to think about, do you believe this is true for curved surfaces? That around every point we have the same total angle, that we have four right angles. Actually, for smooth surfaces, it turns out, yes, that's true. The final postulate is what's known as the parallel postulate. And this is the one that's most controversial. Now, it's not controversial in the sense that it's not true. So what does it say? It says, for any line L and any point P not on the line L, there's a unique 
line parallel to L passing through P. This isn't quite how Euclid thought about it, but that's the modern way of saying what the parallel postulate is. And it's not so much that Euclid was concerned that this postulate was false, but rather he thought it was unnecessary. It really felt like you should be able to prove this parallel postulate from the first four postulates. In fact, Euclid was so suspicious of the parallel postulate that for many, many proofs in his Elements, his book of proofs on geometry, he tried to avoid the parallel postulate as much as possible. And Euclid was not the only one who was suspicious. Over the next 2,000 years, many people tried to prove that the parallel postulate followed from the other four with essentially no success. Until finally, in the 19th century, a number of mathematicians said, well, actually, first of all, it's not possible to prove the parallel postulate from the others. And second of all, the reason it's not possible is that there are several perfectly good geometries, perfectly well-defined notions of geometry in which the parallel postulate doesn't hold. In some sense, it's surprising that it took people this long to figure it out because if you look at the Earth and the way that great arcs behave on the sphere, you'll find that they behave very similarly to points and lines and circles in the plane. And so what these mathematicians discovered is that there's a different kind of geometry called elliptic geometry that satisfies the first four postulates, but not the parallel postulate, that you can't find any pair of lines that don't intersect. There are no parallel lines. In fact, the real revelation was not about spherical or elliptic geometry, but about something called hyperbolic geometry. So the hyperbolic plane is in some sense like the sphere in that every point has curvature different from the flat plane, except now that curvature is negative rather than positive. At every point, we have the same negative curvature. This is difficult to visualize and, and also difficult to draw. So in order to look at hyperbolic geometry, we usually work through what are called models, where objects in the picture are not quite what they seem. So for instance, in this image on the bottom right, we depict straight lines or geodesics in this hyperbolic space by circular arcs that are orthogonal to the boundary of the disk. Now, I'm not going to go deep into hyperbolic geometry today, but one very interesting thing you notice from this picture is, well, the parallel postulate is violated. I have a line L, and I have a point P not on L, and I can find plenty of lines, plenty of these circular arcs that pass through P and are parallel to L that never meet L. Okay? And more generally lines or geodesics on curved surfaces of all kinds are going to behave differently than they do in the plane. So that's the kind of behavior that we'd like to understand today. Before diving into all sorts of definitions, let's look at a few examples of places where geodesics show up. So one simple example is great arcs on the sphere. If you've ever taken a long distance flight, maybe across the ocean, and you sat staring at the flight map on the back of the seat, you might have noticed that your airplane is not traveling along a straight line on the map, but it looks like it's taking a big circular arc. And the reason it's doing that is not because the pilot is taking an inefficient route from where you started to your destination, but because they're actually taking the most efficient route, which is a geodesic on the sphere. Geodesics on the sphere are all great arcs, meaning you take a plane and you slice the sphere through the origin. The intersection between the sphere and the plane is a great circle, and a piece of that great circle is a great arc. This is the fastest way to get from one point to the other on the surface of the Earth, more or less. Okay. Why is it that when we're looking at our map, it looks like we're taking this curved path rather than a straight path? 
Well, because the map has some distortion. For instance, I might be using something like the Mercator projection to flatten the Earth into the plane. When I do that, I distort the appearance of geodesics, just like we distorted the appearance of straight lines when we drew that picture of hyperbolic space. Right? These are models for how curved spaces look that we can more easily draw in the flat plane. Another sort of everyday example of geodesics are shortest paths in graphs. So often you want to find your way from one place to another on the map, and you get some interesting route. I claim this is very much like a geodesic, or at least it's like a geodesic on a domain that has a complicated boundary, like a maze. So if I'm trying to find the shortest path through a maze, well, of course, I can't just take a straight line, but I can take the path of minimal length. Similarly, if I have an abstract graph and I want to find the distance from one vertex to another, I could think about this in terms of differential geometry by imagining that I thicken that graph so it is some nice set and then find the shortest path through that set just like I did through the maze. Now, one thing you notice about this notion of shortest path is it disagrees with one of the two things we said were true about geodesics. We said that they were curves that are both straightest and shortest. These are shortest, but they don't seem particularly straight. You might argue that they're straightest, but they're certainly not straight lines. Okay. So when it comes to talking about geodesics on domains with boundary, things get a little more complicated. The shortest path won't always be straight. Right? So if we have this annulus and we want to go from P to Q, we can't, of course, go along this straight line. The shortest path is going to kind of hug the boundary like this. Right? So meaning it goes straight, and then when it hits the boundary it follows the boundary with the exact same curvature as the boundary curve. Or equivalently, the acceleration matches the boundary normal. On the interior of the domain, it's still going to be made up of paths that are both shortest and straightest. But today, just for simplicity, we're going to mainly consider domains without boundary. Another really interesting place where geodesics show up is in physics. One prominent example is in what's called general relativity. So a fascinating and beautiful thing about the universe we live in is that space itself actually gets warped and deformed by the presence of large, massive objects. So for instance, the sun is going to bend space and time. The earth will bend space and time to a lesser degree. And one reason we know this is true is because when we look at things in the universe, we notice that paths of light behave in a very funny way. So, for instance, if we're sitting on Earth and we're looking out at a distant galaxy, and there's another galaxy in between us and that distant galaxy, we might think, well, it's going to be blocked. We won't be able to see it. What actually happens is all that mass in that middle galaxy warps space so that paths of light bend around it. And so what we get is a phenomenon called gravitational lensing, where that distant galaxy can actually be seen because it's being magnified by the intermediate galaxy. Okay, Lots of other places where geodesics show up in physics. Closer to the kinds of things we'll talk about today is geometry processing. So when working with digital three-dimensional models, there's all sorts of good reasons to want to compute geodesics. One is surface remeshing. I have some description of a surface, and I want to turn it into a collection of sort of nicely shaped triangles. How could I do this? Well, one thing you can imagine is putting down a bunch of seed points on the surface and letting them grow out from those points circles, but geodesic circles. Circles that are at a constant geodesic distance from the seed points. 
When those circles start to collide, they make little patches that partition the surface. And if we connect up the centers of neighboring patches by straight segments, then we get a triangulation of the surface. The more seed points we use, the finer the mesh we get. Another really beautiful place where geodesics are used in algorithms is in computational architecture. So there are a lot of people these days who want to take a freeform surface, some interesting design, and turn it into something that can actually be constructed or manufactured. One way to do this, it turns out, is to break up a surface into sort of geodesic strips, things that go very straight along one direction. It turns out that strips like these become a lot easier to build out of things like sheet metal or glass or other fairly rigid materials. Finally, there's a lot of use of geodesics in shape analysis. We have digital models, and we might want to understand things like what is the correspondence between two models? Well, one really important thing about geodesics is that they're preserved by motions that bend without stretching. So if I bend my arms or I bend my knees, I'm not really changing so much the point-to-point -point distance along the surface of my body. And so if I find two digital models where the point-to-point -point geodesic distances all look pretty much the same, that gives me some sense that these are probably very similar models, or they could be similar models. Okay, so just a bit more formally, this property of geodesics is something known as isometry invariance. Isometries are special deformations that don't change the intrinsic geometry of the shape. What do we mean by intrinsic geometry? So formally, what we're saying is isometries preserve the Riemannian metric. The thing that lets us measure the lengths of tangent vectors and the angles between tangent vectors, but nothing else. A nice example is folding up a map. So if I have a map of my city and I fold it up, that doesn't change the angle between north or south. And it also doesn't change the area of a city block, right? So this folding motion is an isometry of the map. Likewise, the shortest path between two cities, or in other words, the geodesic, doesn't change if we roll up the map, right? There's still no shorter way to get between those two points. So this is a key fact about geodesics. They are isometry invariant. Okay, so based on all these observations, how can we come up with a definition of discrete geodesics? Meaning one that'll work for, let's say, polyhedral surfaces. Well, as we've done before in this class, what we're going to do is play the game of discrete differential geometry and consider different equivalent characterizations in the smooth setting that might lead to different interesting inequivalent definitions in the discrete setting. So in particular, we can say geodesics are straightest curves. They have zero acceleration. They're locally shortest curves. They sort of minimize length between nearby points. They have no geodesic curvature. We've talked a lot about curvature in the past. One thing we'll see today is that they're harmonic maps from an interval to a surface or a manifold. So we can connect geodesics back to the Laplacian. And also, might sound a little odd, we can say that geodesics are the gradient of the geodesic distance function. Again, a lot of the time, the thing we say in the smooth setting sounds a little obvious, but it will change the way we talk about geodesics in the discrete setting. And from there, there are a lot of other things we could consider. Okay, so each of these different starting points will have different consequences. And today we're going to focus on just two. We're going to see that for simplicial surfaces, for triangle meshes, the notions of shortest and straightest, these two fundamental properties of geodesics, actually disagree.
So let's start by talking about this shortest picture of geodesics. What do we really mean when we say geodesics are locally shortest? Well, again, a Euclidean line segment can be characterized as the shortest path between two distinct points. If we try anything else, we're always longer. How then can we characterize a whole Euclidean line? We can't say that the line is the shortest distance between two endpoints because, well, where are the endpoints? So what we will say is that it's locally shortest for any two nearby points on the path. We can't find a shorter route. What precisely do we mean by nearby points? Well, nearby basically means the points are close enough that the shortest path between them is unique. We'll talk about this a little more in detail later on when we introduce the idea of the injectivity radius. But for now, this description gives us one basic definition for geodesics. One very important thing to realize at this moment is that locally shortest does not imply globally shortest. So for instance, on this sphere, I have two points on the equator, and I've drawn the globally shortest curve. There really is no other possible route between those two points that's shorter. But here's a different curve that satisfies my notion of locally shortest. If I look at any little piece of the curve, it minimizes the distance between those points. Both of these curves are geodesic paths. Okay? Do not get confused about this point. Geodesic does not mean that it is the globally shortest path. For that, we have another term, which is a minimal geodesic. A minimal geodesic is simply the shortest possible geodesic curve between two points. Okay? So, it turns out there's a very nice relationship between Dirichlet energy, which we studied when we talked about the Laplacian, and the length of a curve. So remember that the Dirichlet energy, the basic idea, is that it measures the smoothness of a function. So for instance, if I have a curve, which I express as a function from the unit interval into the plane, right? And by the way here, I mean really any kind of curve at all, not an arc length parameterized curve. So I'm gonna draw little dots that are equally spaced along the interval. And you see that those dots are not equally spaced on the curve. In some places we're going faster, in others we're going slower. Okay, so if we have this function that describes a curve, its Dirichlet energy is just the integral of the derivative of that function squared. Again, capturing somehow how smooth or regular this function is. How do we relate Dirichlet energy to curve length? Well, we can write the curve gamma as a reparameterization of a unit speed curve gamma hat, meaning another curve that has the same shape, but where we travel along it at unit speed. How do we do this? Well, we have some speed function c that goes from the unit interval to the real numbers that tells us how fast we're traveling along gamma. At zero, c is zero. At one, c is equal to the curve length, L. Okay, And in this case, it looks like the function on the bottom right. You can see that initially we travel very slowly, then we travel pretty quickly, and then we slow down again, which is why the dots get clumped up at either end. Okay, then in this case, gamma is equal to gamma hat of c of t. And so we know that the norm of the derivative of gamma is just equal to the norm of the derivative of the speed function. Because gamma hat itself is traveling at unit speed. Okay, so let's try to find the smoothest curve, right? The Dirichlet energy tells us how smooth a curve is. And so we could try minimizing the Dirichlet energy to find the smoothest possible curve. Well, one way of rewriting this problem of saying we want to minimize Dirichlet energy over all curves gamma is to say we want to minimize over all arc length parameterized curves gamma hat, 
and over all parameterization functions C. What are we minimizing? The Dirichlet energy, which we can also write as just C prime of T squared. Okay? One thing we can notice is if we ignore this outer minimization and just ask for a fixed curve gamma hat, which parameterization is smoothest, which minimizes this Dirichlet energy, well, let's think about that. All we're really saying, if we look at this graph on the bottom right, is which curve between the two fixed endpoints is smoothest, which one has the smallest squared first derivative, well, that's just going to be a straight line. That's just saying the curve, the parameterized curve gamma with smallest Dirichlet energy is the arc length parameterized curve. Okay, So we know that this inner minimization always just gives us L squared, the slope of this line. And what that means is minimizing the Dirichlet energy of a parameterized curve is the same as minimizing the squared length of the corresponding arc length parameterized curve. Okay? So if you didn't follow the argument there, that's okay. The key idea is that for a curve, minimizing Dirichlet energy will minimize length. In fact, it'll do a little bit more than that it'll smooth out the parameterization. Okay? So let's consider again a curve gamma from the unit interval into the plane. And as we just said, we know we can find the shortest path between two points by minimizing Dirichlet energy subject to fixed endpoints. Gamma at zero is equal to some point P, gamma at one is equal to another point Q. Okay? So we want to minimize now, the Dirichlet energy of our parameterized curve, and by using integration by parts, we can show that this is the same as minimizing the integral over the interval of gamma inner product with its second derivative, times minus 1. So if you remember our discussion of the Laplacian, this is just saying we can write the Dirichlet energy in terms of the Laplacian, or the second derivative. And if we now go and take the gradient of this energy with respect to gamma, it's not hard to show that we get a Poisson equation. So we find that the curve that minimizes this energy is a solution to the equation second derivative of gamma is equal to zero subject to endpoint conditions. At the beginning of the interval, it's equal to P. At the end of the interval, it's equal to Q. What kind of function satisfies all these conditions? What is a function of one variable that has no second derivative and meets given values at the two endpoints? Okay, hopefully that's not too hard to figure out because it's what we did on the last slide. We said this has to be a straight line, a linear function, or an affine function. Okay? So that's a very roundabout way of convincing ourselves that a straight line is the shortest path between two points. But the real purpose of doing this is that everything we just said applies pretty much directly to curves on curved surfaces and curved spaces. We can again get geodesics by minimizing Dirichlet energy subject to fixed endpoints. And actually, basically all of those same arguments work out in exactly the same way. So the key idea is geodesics, in general, are harmonic functions. They're functions whose second derivatives are equal to zero. Harmonic functions in general are super important in differential geometry, basically because they give a canonical way of mapping one space into another. And geodesics are a great example of that.
Okay, so again, on curved surfaces, everything works out basically the same way. Let's say we now have a curve gamma that's a map from an interval into a surface M. The Dirichlet energy looks basically the same. It's the integral over the interval of the square of the norm of the first derivative of gamma. The only thing we have to think a little bit about here is what do we mean by the norm here? And that's given by the Riemannian metric G. Remember, all G is, all the Riemannian metric is, is it just gives us the ordinary way we'd expect to take inner products or dot products between tangent vectors on the surface. Right? So now gamma prime, the velocity of our curve, is a vector tangent to the surface, and g is just telling us take the inner product between two copies of that tangent vector. Okay? Geodesics are still critical points of this energy. They're still harmonic functions. But something really interesting happens. It's no longer the case that they're necessarily global minimizers of this energy. In the plane, there was only one solution. There's only one geodesic between two distinct points, the straight line segment of unit speed. Not true anymore for curved surfaces. So here's one simple example. Again, we could say on the sphere, we have these two points on the hemisphere. One possible geodesic is the minimum length curve, this little short curve. But here's another solution. We said this should also be a geodesic. Why is this a geodesic from the perspective of Dirichlet energy? Well, because it's not a minimizer, but it is a saddle point. Remember, critical points of functions can be minima, maxima, but they can also be saddle points. What do we mean that it's a saddle point? How can we understand what a saddle point of Dirichlet energy is like? Well, we could think of this curve on the sphere as being one point in a possible landscape of different curves that we can put on the sphere, all with the same endpoints. So I'm drawing a little cartoon here. I'm imagining that I'm plotting the graph of the Dirichlet energy over the plane, which kind of represents the space of all possible curves. Okay? And the first thing we can notice is that for any little perturbation we make of this curve, maybe we add some bumps upward, there's going to be, just by symmetry of the sphere and, and by symmetry of our curve, there's going to be another perturbation that's kind of equal and opposite. Right? So maybe these same little bumps pointing down. So that gives us a sense that we're at a saddle point. We have two equal and opposite directions that we can go that can't possibly do different things to the energy just by symmetry. We can also notice that there are perturbations that definitely make the curve longer, that increase the Dirichlet energy, and there are definitely perturbations that make the energy go down, that make the length shorter. So we could add lots of little wiggles, or we could try to smoothly pull the curve over the top of the sphere. And so that really tells us we're sitting at a saddle point. There's some directions where the energy goes up, there's some directions where the energy goes down, and we're at a critical point. Okay, so that's in some sense a little unfortunate because it means we can no longer find geodesics by just solving this easy linear Laplace equation that we had in the plane. In fact, as with many things in geometry and in calculus, it turns out that there are very, very few geodesics that we can really write down and find in closed form. If we want any hope of getting our hands on geodesics, we're going to need numerical algorithms. Okay, so let's move now to the discrete case. And, you know, I know that geodesics aren't all just about shortest paths, but that's something we can at least start to get our head around. So how do we find shortest paths in the discrete case? Right? Shortest paths should at least give us some way of getting our hands on geodesics. So, for instance, let's say I have this graph. Uh, 
and I want to find the shortest path between these two endpoints. Well, especially if you're coming from computer science, something pops into your head, oh, I should probably try Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Find the shortest path along the edges of this graph. Well, there's a problem with using Dijkstra's algorithm, which is that the shortest path in the edge graph is almost never a geodesic. It's clear that we could go a lot quicker and a lot straighter by just going along the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right, right? And that's not just because we have a mesh or a graph that's too coarse. If I keep refining this graph, it could be that I still get this path that's way longer than it should be. In fact, in this picture, I didn't shorten the curve at all, right? The total distance I traveled to the right is the same as before, and the total distance I travel down is the same as before. Right? So how could we do a little better here? How could we make our curve look more like a geodesic? Well, one idea is to, at least if we want to find a locally shortest geodesic, maybe not the globally shortest one, we could just take this Dijkstra path and we could start straightening it bit by bit until no more progress can be made. So for instance, if I have these two edges in my Dijkstra path, maybe what I do now is I let them run through the middle of some of the triangles. I have them cut through these triangles and just shorten it slightly. And if I do that again and again and again for, let's say, pairs of edges that are not yet shortest or something like that, I will probably converge to a locally shortest path, to a geodesic. And there are algorithms that work this way. Okay, what if we want a little bit more? What if we don't just want a locally shortest path, but we really want to be able to guarantee that we get the globally shortest path? Right? With our little iterative straightening procedure, it's not clear that we'll always get to the shortest path. We could start out with a bad guess, or we could get stuck in some kind of local minimum. So what can we do if we want the globally shortest path? Well, if we really want to understand this problem, we're going to have to take a close look at the behavior of locally shortest paths near vertices. So even locally shortest paths require a little bit of care near a vertex of our triangulation. And in fact, the behavior of these locally shortest paths is going to depend a lot on the kind of curvature of the vertex, or what we called the angle defect when we talked about discrete curvature. So remember that at a vertex i, I could take the sum of all the angles theta touching vertex i and subtract that from 2 pi. And that gives me some notion of curvature. If those angles sum to exactly 2 pi, then I know that the vertex is flat. So here's a vertex. It doesn't look flat. It's not sitting in the plane but it's been carefully constructed so that if I were to go and try to unfold it into the plane, right, no stretching, but just unfold it into the plane, it turns out the angle sum to exactly 2 pi, so the angle defect is 0. In this case, it's pretty easy to understand what geodesics should look like. Geodesics, or locally shortest paths, simply go straight through the vertex along a straight line. All right. What if instead the angle defect is positive, meaning the angle sum to something less than 2 pi, right? Like on this cone vertex. So I can look at this from the side, or here I'm going to look at it from the top. Okay. Again, I can try to put this into the plane, but in order to put it into the plane without stretching or distorting it, I'm going to have to cut along one of the edges. Okay, so I cut maybe along this edge ij, and now I can lay it out flat in the plane, and certainly I notice now the angle sum is less than 2 pi, the angle defect is greater than 0. And I can ask, what do shortest paths look like in the vicinity of this vertex? Well, the key observation is that we can always go faster around the cone than straight through it. So for instance, if I have these two points p and q on the cone, well, you notice that in the planar layout, they're actually connected just by a straight line segment. 
So that's definitely faster than going from P to I and then to Q. And that's going to be true no matter where I put P and Q. Okay? And then the third case is I have a saddle vertex. So something that, okay, it might look like a saddle like this in space, but the way you really know it's a saddle is you, again, cut along one of the edges, you lay it out flat in the plane, and you notice there's some self-overlap. Right? The total angle sum around I is greater than 2 pi, or the angle defect is less than 0. The really interesting thing that happens here is there are always many locally shortest paths passing through a given saddle vertex. So in this case, for instance, I could start at P, go to I, and then go to the point Q1. This corresponds to drawing a straight line in the plane. So I know that's a locally shortest path. I couldn't make it any straighter. But on the other side of the cut, there's also kind of another copy of the point P, right? So I could also go along a straight line from that second copy of P to a different point Q2. I get another straight line segment. I get another locally shortest path through the vertex I and that also passes through the vertex P. Really fascinating, right? In fact, there's this whole family of locally shortest paths that pass through the vertex I. So hopefully this reminds you a little bit about when we talked about hyperbolic geometry, which also has negative curvature, we saw that it violated the parallel postulate in a very similar way. Right? For a given line and a given point, there's a whole family of lines parallel to the line passing through the point. Likewise, in the spherical or the elliptic case, we see there's something that can never happen. A locally shortest curve can never pass through the vertex. Two parallel lines, well, you can never have two parallel lines. So something in a beautiful way lines up between the smooth and the discrete picture. How can we compute such paths in practice? How can we find globally shortest polyhedral geodesics? Well, for the most part, algorithms for these shortest discrete paths generalize Dijkstra's algorithm to include paths through triangles. And actually, I would say the vast majority of them are based on this idea by Mitchell Mount and Papa Dimitrio, which is to kind of extend Dijkstra to what people sometimes call a continuous Dijkstra algorithm. So the basic idea is to track rather than walking along the edges, you track intervals or windows of common geodesic paths emanating from the same source. And if you do this over the whole mesh, you get a picture like you see on the top here. You can plot either the geodesic curves, kind of these rays emanating from the source, or the geodesic distance function. Here we're looking at level sets of increasing distance from the source. Okay, and starting with that basic algorithm, there's many ways you can improve this by pruning windows, by making approximations, by doing things in parallel, but still the same asymptotic complexity, this order n squared log n in the number of vertices. Maybe you can shave off a log factor. And I should also say in practice, some of these algorithms can really be quite efficient. So you often don't get the worst case behavior in practice. Okay, so now that we've seen a bit about shortest geodesics in the smooth setting and in the discrete setting, we can compare the two and we can say, how well are we doing? Does our discrete notion of geodesics really capture what we wanted it to from the smooth setting? Well, here's just one little thing we can look at. So in the smooth case, we know that two minimal geodesics, gamma one and gamma two, from a source point P to distinct points P1 and P2, are going to intersect only if one is contained in the other. In other words, two shortest paths from different points back to the source don't cross each other unless they're actually running along each other. Right? If they did, you could make one of them shorter. On the other hand, we just saw that in the discrete case, you can have lots of different locally shortest paths coming out of the same saddle vertex.
right? Many geodesics can coincide at this saddle vertex, and so sometimes these are called pseudo sources. Okay, but the the real thing to notice here is that things have started to break down. We notice that there's some things about geodesics we didn't capture with our discrete definition. There's one basic property they satisfy, which is that they're locally shortest paths. But not everything else is guaranteed to work the same way. Another really interesting thing to look at are closed geodesics. So a pretty cool and maybe a little surprising theorem is that if I have a smooth convex surface, like the one you see on the right, then it's guaranteed to contain a simple closed geodesic, meaning a geodesic loop that does not cross itself. So here's one example. And these are called sometimes a Birkhoff equator. Okay. Actually, even more amazing is that there are always at least three so no matter what shape this convex surface is, there's always three, at least three closed geodesic loops that don't cross themselves. Okay, And that's it. There are some examples of surfaces where you only get three, but there are always at least three. What about the discrete case? So interestingly enough, here's a, a theorem which says that most convex polyhedra do not have simple closed geodesics, not even one. So the word most here basically means that if you found a convex polyhedron that had a closed geodesic loop, like maybe the cube, okay, it's pretty easy to find a closed geodesic loop on the cube, but that you can always perturb the vertices just a little bit to get a nearby convex polyhedron that no longer has a closed geodesic, okay? Why is this true? Why is it not possible usually to find closed geodesics on discrete surfaces? Well, actually, this is a really nice application of a lot of the stuff we talked about with discrete curvature and gauss bonnet Okay, so a shortest geodesic, first of all, can't pass through convex vertices. We said a shortest geodesic can't pass through cone vertices. So if we had a closed geodesic, then it would just be passing through faces and edges of the triangulation. And if we cut along this geodesic, it's going to split our convex polyhedron into two disks, into two polyhedral disks. Okay? And now we can remember the discrete gauss bonnet theorem that said the sum of the angle defects over all vertices plus the sum of all geodesic curvatures over boundary vertices, meaning the deviation from pi, is equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic chi. Okay, So in the case of our two disks, each of them have Euler characteristic equal to 1. We know that the boundary geodesic curvature is 0 because we cut along a geodesic. And so what we're really asking for is a curve that cuts our polyhedron into two pieces where the sum of angle defects at vertices are equal to exactly 2 pi on both sides. How likely is that to happen? Right? Not very likely. Again, if I had such a polyhedron, I could just jiggle it ever so slightly, and those angle defects wouldn't perfectly partition them into 2 pi on either side. Okay? So again, this shortest characterization of discrete geodesics fails to capture some properties that we know are true in the smooth setting. Let's keep going here and look at some different objects associated with geodesics, namely the cut locus and its corresponding injectivity radius. So what's this all about? For a source point P on a smooth surface, the cut locus is a set of all points Q such that there's not a unique minimal geodesic between P and Q. The injectivity radius is then the distance to the closest point on the cut locus. So here I think it really helps to see an example. For instance, on the sphere, the cut locus of any point P is just the antipodal point minus P. Why is that? Well, there are lots of shortest paths between P and minus P. It's not unique. 
And the injectivity radius in this case is just the length of those paths. So the inject injectivity radius basically covers the whole sphere. In general, the cut locus can be a lot more complicated than just a point. So here's an example of kind of a torus with a bump on it, and the point P is actually on the back of the torus. And you can imagine that the cut locus is the place where wave fronts that emanate at P kind of crash into themselves. So that's this red set of curves we see here. The injectivity radius is the closest point on that red graph from the point P. Right? How does this all play out in the discrete setting? What does the cut locus look like for polyhedral surfaces? Well, one thing to remember is that it's always shorter to go around a cone-like vertex than to pass straight through it. And for that reason, the polyhedral cut locus will contain every single cone vertex of the entire surface. Right, so here we have a point P again on the back of the polyhedron, and you can see the red cut locus is a tree structure that touches every single vertex. This looks very, very different from how we might expect a smooth cut locus to look like. If we imagine that this polyhedron was sampled from a nice smooth ellipsoid, well, on an ellipsoid, the cut locus is just this nice line segment, right? It's not a whole tree. And so this is another place where we can notice that even though we're giving a really, really exact and precise definition of geodesics for our polyhedral surfaces, they don't necessarily capture the behavior of smooth surfaces. In other words, even if you take a really nice triangulation of a smooth surface and then compute something about discrete geodesics on it, even using this exact definition, you might be fooled. You might have the wrong idea about what's going on. So you have to be careful. Here's a similar object, the medial axis. So now let's talk for a moment about regions with boundary. So the medial axis of a surface or a region is a set of all points P that do not have a unique closest point on the boundary. Simple example, if I have a circular disk, the medial axis is just the point at the center. There are many equally fast ways to get to the boundary from the center point. What about an ellipse? What do you think the medial axis of the ellipse looks like? Okay, well, a pretty reasonable guess is that at least the center point should be included, right? Because, for instance, if we draw a ball around that center point, it's going to make contact with two distinct points on the boundary. There are at least two paths from the center that have the same length. And this ball is something we're going to call a medial ball. So a medial ball is a ball with center on the medial axis and radius given by the distance to the closest point. There are certainly other medial balls in the ellipse, for instance, this one, right, and this one, and lots of others on a segment through the middle of the ellipse. Okay, so that's what the medial axis looks like for the ellipse. Like the cut locus, the medial axis can get pretty complicated. So here's a more general shape with all sorts of interesting branching behavior, just like we saw with a cut locus. Typically there are three branches, right? At every juncture here, we see that there's three red lines branching off. Why do you think that's true? Why do you think there's typically three? Okay, well, if there were just two, right, if the medial ball had two points of contact on the boundary, then it wouldn't look like a special point. It would just be an ordinary point on the curve. And if there were four... Right? We have a medial ball that simultaneously makes contact with four distinct points on the boundary. Then we could just jiggle the boundary a little bit, perturb it a little bit, so that now it only makes contact with three. In some way, this is like saying 
If I have three legs on a table, it'll always sit flat on the ground. If I have four legs and it sits flat, then just making one of them slightly shorter will cause it to kind of wobble back and forth. It's not a generic condition that there are four points of contact. Interesting. So the medial axis is pretty cool because it provides a sort of dual representation of the original shape. In other words, if we know the medial axis and we know the radius of the medial balls at each point along the medial axis, then we can recover the original shape by just taking the union of all these medial balls. And this is a fact that gets used quite a lot in practice. So how do we talk about the medial axis in the discrete case? What's the medial axis of a discrete domain? Well, let's start with a simple domain. Let's start with a square. So you could maybe think, oh, the square is kind of like a discrete circle in a way. What did the medial axis of the circle look like? It just looked like this one point, right? What is the medial axis of the square going to look like? I mean, it'll also include this center point, certainly. But can you find any other points? Sure. For instance, if I start moving up and to the left, I get balls that come into contact with the top and the left edge of the square. And interestingly, I can bring those balls as close as I want to the corner. And I can do that in all four directions. And I get a medial axis that looks like an X rather than a single point. So very different than what we had for the circle. What about a rectangle? What does the medial axis look like here? Well, what happened with an ellipse is that we had this line of medial balls in the middle that all made contact with the top and the bottom of the ellipse. Is that what happens with the rectangle? Well, yeah, sort of. I still have a bunch of balls along the rectangle that make contact with the top and the bottom, but I still also have these balls that go off into the corners. And so the medial axis doesn't just look like a segment, it looks like a segment connected to these diagonals. Right? So we start to see what we saw with the discrete cut locus. The discrete medial axis is a bit more complicated. How about this non-convex polygon? What do you think the discrete medial axis looks like for this shape? Take a minute to think about it. Okay, so again, we can start drawing a bunch of the medial balls. And if we really trace these out carefully, then we notice something interesting happens, which is the medial axis is no longer just comprised of straight edges, right? We have this curved piece around the non-convex vertex. In general, the medial axis is going to touch every convex vertex, just like the discrete cut locus touched every cone vertex. So if we have this shape here, which looks at first glance like a circle, but is actually a polygon with many, many sides, then the discrete medial axis is not going to be a point. It's going to be a bunch of line segments that all go to the corners of the polygon. Right? So very different than what we wanted from our circle. You would think that as we refine the polygon, we should get closer to the smooth definition, but actually that's not what happens at all. Similarly, if we have an ellipse made of many sides and we compute its discrete medial axis, it looks like this. Right? It doesn't quite look like the medial axis of a smooth ellipse. It has all these extra branches hanging off the side. And in general, this is what's going to happen, right? even for non-convex polygons. So one idea is to try filtering 
these branches out by picking some threshold or something like that. Um, but it's really hard to say in this kind of ad hoc filtering process which pieces should remain. And there's been a lot of work on alternative kinds of shape skeletons or definitions or ways of approaching the medial axis for discrete curves and discrete surfaces. We'll actually talk about one in just a second that works pretty well. Um, but first, just wanted to show a couple pictures of what does the medial axis look like in 3D, right? The same definition applies in any dimension. We can look at the set of points where there's not a unique closest point on the boundary or equivalently where the maximal radius ball around that point touches more than one point on the boundary. So here's what we get for a surface in 3D. On the left, we have the, the shape, this boundary mesh for the camel, and we can see the medial axis in green overlaid on this shape. So again, it gives some kind of skeleton of the shape. Especially in 3D, this medial axis gets really hard to compute exactly because it has not just linear pieces, but also quadratic pieces. And so what people often do in practice is approximate it by a simplicial complex, by something that only has linear pieces. How can we do this? Well, there are a lot of algorithms for computing or approximating the medial axis. One really nice starting point is to use the Voronoi diagram. So you might recall that the Voronoi diagram partitions space into regions that are closest to a given set of points. In this case, what we can do is we can take our shape, we can sample some points on the boundary, construct the Voronoi diagram, and then here's the key idea. What we notice is that there are some cells that are kind of tall and skinny in this diagram. And we're going to keep the edges that are at the kind of bottom of these tall and skinny cells. So in this case, these red edges. And you notice that these red edges really start to approximate pretty well the medial axis. For those of you who aren't convinced and who think this sounds pretty ad hoc, well, let's just go ahead and try adding a bunch more points on the boundary. And what you really start to see is these cells get really, really tall and skinny. It becomes really unambiguous what we mean by the short sides of the cells. And the curve that we get by keeping these short sides really does approach the medial axis. In fact, you can prove that with enough points, you get the correct topology and eventually the correct geometry. Actually, more interesting than talking about constructing the medial axis is a basic task in geometry processing. We have a bunch of points that we've measured from some device like a laser scanner or maybe methods from computer vision. And we want to connect up those points to get a nice surface mesh. How do we do that? Well, one nice way to do it is to take the same kind of approach. We take our shape, we sample the points. You can imagine these are measurements that we're taking in the real world. Then we construct the Voronoi diagram just as before. But now instead of keeping the short sides of these cells, we're going to connect two cells along long edges. So if I have two skinny cells that are neighbors along a long edge, then I'm going to connect them by a line segment. And so here we got a nice reconstruction of the original shape. Again, as we add more and more points, we're going to eventually get a sort of provably good approximation of the original surface. In general, there are a lot of nice applications of the medial axis. We've already seen surface reconstruction and shape skeletons. We can use the radii of the medial balls to give some notion of local feature size. We can use this dual representation and approximate the shape by some sampling of medial balls to do fast collision detection. Right? It's a lot easier to check collisions with a sphere than with some complicated triangulated surface. And they also show up in simulation algorithms, for instance, in fluid simulation by resampling the particles at different moments of time, we can maintain the fidelity of the simulation, and so on. All right, so let's move now to this other perspective on geodesics, which is the idea that they're some kind of straightest path. 
right? So a Euclidean line, for instance, can be characterized as a curve that's as straight as possible. How can we make this statement more precise? Well, geometrically, we're saying the line has no curvature. So if we say that theta is the angle between some reference direction and the tangent of the curve, then this direction, theta, doesn't change along the curve. That was one of our definitions of curvature for a plane curve, the derivative of the tangent direction with respect to arc length. A kind of dynamic point of view is that the curve has no acceleration. So if we think of the tangent vector to the curve as actually the velocity vector of a particle moving along the curve, then this velocity vector remains constant as we go along the curve. It doesn't turn, it doesn't get faster, it doesn't get slower, it just keeps going the same way. How can we generalize this picture to curves in manifolds? On the geometric side, we're going to replace this condition that there's no plane curvature with saying there's no geodesic curvature. And the dynamic viewpoint actually leads to some very deep and important ideas in differential geometry. To talk about what it means to have no acceleration on a curved space, we have to introduce something called the covariant derivative. Okay, So let's start with this geometric perspective. So if we have a curve, gamma, with a tangent t, and the surface has normal n, then we're going to define a third vector, b, which is t cross n, called the binormal. We can then decompose bending into two pieces, into the normal curvature, which is saying how big is the change in the tangent along the normal direction, and the geodesic curvature, which says how big is the change in the tangent along the binormal direction. It's important to realize that the curve is going to be forced to have normal curvature just due to the curvature of the surface itself. So for instance, a curve that goes along the sphere can't be perfectly straight. It has to stay on the sphere. It has to bend along with the normal of the sphere. So even if I'm driving my car along the surface of the Earth, and I think I'm going along a perfectly straight tra trajectory, I'm not turning my wheel left or right, I'm actually bending a little bit. I have normal curvature. On the other hand, if I were driving on a perfectly flat plane, but I'm turning my steering wheel back and forth, then I have geodesic curvature. I have curvature that's really due to some bending of the curve and not due to bending of the surface itself. Okay? And the key idea from this geometric perspective is that a geodesic is a curve where the geodesic curvature is zero. So a geodesic is as straight as you possibly could be while remaining on the surface. To talk about this idea in the discrete case, we need to first say what we mean by a discrete curve on a discrete surface. So one possible definition is to say a discrete curve in a simplicial or triangulated surface M is any continuous curve gamma that is piecewise linear in each simplex. So this doesn't have to just be a path of edges, right? We could pass through faces we could have multiple vertices and a single face, all sorts of possibilities. How can we encode such a curve? Well, one way to do it is to say we have a sequence of simplices, vertices, edges, and faces, and barycentric coordinates for each simplex that tell us what linear combination of these vertices describes the point. Okay, so for instance, we could start out in a triangle ILJ at some point, described by these three coordinates, point 0.1, point 0.7, point 0.2. We could then move to a point on the edge IJ with some other coordinates. We could then move to a point on another triangle, and then finally to a vertex where we only have one barycentric coordinate, just one, right? The only combination of one vertex is to be at that vertex. And connecting up those points gives us a discrete curve. Okay, so then how do we talk about the curvature, the geodesic curvature of this curve? Well, for a plane curve, one definition of discrete curvature was the turning angle kappa as we go along the curve, or equivalently we could measure 
the deviation of the interior angle from pi. So pi minus the exterior angle. Since most points of a simplicial surface are intrinsically flat, we can adopt this same definition for discrete geodesic curvature. What do I mean by that? All I mean is, well, if my vertex is on the middle of a face, there's nothing strange going on. I just measure the angle between consecutive segments. If I have a vertex that passes through an edge of a triangle mesh, you think, oh, something funny happens here, but not really because I can always unfold these two triangles into the plane without distorting them. And so my discrete geodesic curvature is just going to be pi minus the interior angle in the unfolding. This is just like my story about the map from the beginning. Right? Geodesics are an intrinsic property of surfaces, so if I fold up the map or fold up the triangle mesh, it's not changing anything about geodesics or geodesic curvature. So again, all of the difficulty comes from the vertices. Vertices are a pain because we can't unfold them into the plane without causing some kind of distortion. Right? Remember, we had all this trouble with shortest geodesics and how they behaved around vertices of different kinds. So how else can we think about geodesic curvature at vertices? Well, in the smooth setting, we characterize geodesics as curves with zero geodesic curvature. In the discrete setting, we can't unfold. There are no shortest paths through some vertices. So we need to come up with a different starting point in the smooth setting that translates more easily into the discrete setting. One alternative characterization is to say, quite simply, that if I have a straight line in the plane, then the angle on either side is the same. If I draw some circle around a point on the straight line, then the length of the arc on the left and the length of the arc on the right are equal. If I have a curve that has some curvature, I draw the same circle, these two arc lengths are different. Okay, And this stupidly simple description translates naturally to the discrete setting. We're just going to say if we have a curve, a discrete curve that passes through a vertex, then we're going to say it's a geodesic if it has the same angle on either side of the curve, theta l equals theta r. Now, importantly, unlike the plane, these angles might not both be equal to pi. Right? In general, they'll be equal to half the angle sum, which is not always equal to 2 pi. But in a lot of ways, it captures the spirit of what we mean by a geodesic. And so this is what we'll call a discrete straightest geodesic. Now, one thing you might quite reasonably say here is, is this even worth worrying about? How likely is it that a curve passes exactly through a vertex? But consider something like simulating a continuous wave propagating out from a source. In order to define what this wave is and how it behaves, you really do need to consider this behavior of, of passing through vertices. One thing you also notice here is both on the smooth surface on the left and the discrete surface on the right, there are these interesting features in this wave, these kind of sharp points, which are called conjugate points. They're basically the place where the wave first runs into itself. Okay, And we can understand these a little more detail by looking at what's called the exponential map. So the exponential map is really just something that tells us where we end up if we walk along a geodesic. A little more precisely, if we have a point P on a surface M, then the exponential map is going to take a tangent vector x to the point reached by walking along a geodesic in the direction of x for a distance equal to the length of x. So the exponential map is a function that takes tangent vectors as inputs and produces points on the surface as outputs. Another 
maybe mental way of thinking about what the exponential map is doing is it's really taking that tangent plane and stretching it over the surface. Right? If you think about what does the exponential map do to lots of points inside the tangent plane? Okay. Why do we care about the exponential map? Well, it basically provides a notion of translation for curved domains. So in the plane, it's easy to say if I have a point and I have a vector, that I can translate the point along the vector to a new point. That's exactly what the exponential map is doing for curved surfaces and curved manifolds. A basic question you can ask about the exponential map is, is it surjective? In other words, can we reach every point Q by walking along some geodesic starting at a point P? Right? So I hand you a point Q and you're standing at P. Is there always a direction I can walk to reach Q? Well, the answer turns out to be yes, at least for a nice, smooth, compact surface with no boundary. And the way we do it is almost silly. We say, well, sure, we just find the shortest geodesic between P and Q, and we take the tangent vector to that geodesic at the point P. So now if I take a vector X that's pointing in the direction of the tangent and whose length is equal to the length of the curve, then sure, by construction, applying the exponential map to that vector will take me back to Q. If I walk in that direction for the length of the curve, guess what, I'll end up back at Q. Okay, but this is a nice thing to be able to do, to say which direction and how far do I have to go to reach a given point. And so we give this vector a special name. We call it the, the logarithm, or we say the logarithm of a point Q at a point P is this vector X that takes us to that point via the exponential map, via walking along a geodesic. Okay? And so this goes in the opposite direction of the exponential map, it takes points on the surface as input and gives us a tangent vector at the current point as output. Now, there's something just a little funny about what I just said. So you might ask, is the log map uniquely determined? So if I'm standing at P and I wanna reach Q, is there only one geodesic I can walk along to reach Q? Right. Equivalently, I could say, is the exponential map always injective? If I give different vectors to the exponential map, do I always end up at different points? Well, no. Right. So consider the exponential map on the sphere. I start out at a point P, I want to reach a point Q. Certainly there is a direction I can walk along a geodesic to reach Q. But I could also just keep going. I just keep walking. I go around and I walk around this great circular arc until once again, I get back to Q. And in fact, I could keep walking after that. I can go around as many times as I like, right? So by convention, we usually say that the log map is gonna give us the smallest vector X, the vector with smallest norm such that applying the exponential map to x puts us at q. Okay, interesting. Why are we talking about the log and exponential map? Why are these useful for anything? And the, the really important idea behind the log map and the exponential map is that it allows us to locally work with points on curved spaces as though we were just working with points or vectors in the flat plane. And that ability to translate between doing things in the plane and doing things on curved surfaces is really important for defining and computing all sorts of other quantities. A nice example is computing averages on surfaces. This is a really interesting problem if you've never thought about it. So if we think about points in the plane, taking an average is easy, right? I'll just 
add up the coordinates of these points, and then divide by the number of points to get the usual notion of the average or the center. How do we talk about an average of points on a curved surface? So for instance, on the sphere, maybe we have these five points that are just a little bit off the equator. Well, if we go ahead and use the same formula, we're going to end up with a point that's not on the sphere anymore. It's going to be a point somewhere in the middle. right? So this average might not be on the surface. In fact, in some cases, we might not even know how our surface is embedded in space. So we simply can't apply this standard averaging formula. An excellent example of this is averaging rotations. It turns out rotations are actually points in some kind of curved space that's difficult to think about as a subset of Euclidean space. So this really motivates the need for a different kind of average. One good definition is something called the Karcher mean. So the Karcher mean is the point that minimizes the sum of squared geodesic distances to all points. So for instance, in our example here on the sphere, the Karcher mean is a point near sort of the North Pole that's about equidistant to all of these points, these white points. In the plane, by the way, the Karcher mean just agrees with the usual notion of an average. Why is that true? That's a good little one to think about. So the next question is, how would we actually compute the Karcher mean? And it turns out that the log map and the exponential map are super useful here. Exactly this idea of doing calculations in the tangent plane that we would ordinarily try to do in the flat plane. Okay, so let's say that we have a bunch of points yi, and we want to compute the mean, the Karcher mean, so we have an iterative algorithm. We first pick a random initial starting point x, and then we compute the log vi of all points yi. Meaning, at x, we just want to know what direction to walk and how far to walk to get to each of the points yi. That's encoded by these tangent vectors vi. Now here's the great part. At this point, we just have vectors in a plane, in the tangent plane. So we can go ahead and compute the mean, the average, as we normally would. If this vector is not equal to zero, then we're not yet at the mean. We're not at the Karcher mean. And so we can move x along the vector v using the exponential map and repeat. Right? We go through this whole process again of finding the direction of the points at this new point, and so on. If we do this, will actually quickly converge to some Karcher mean of the white points. Now in general, it's pretty easy to see, the Karcher mean is not unique. Right? So let's say that our set of points that we're trying to find the average for is just a pair of antipodal points plus y and minus y on the sphere. It's pretty clear there are a lot of points that satisfy our definition of the Karcher mean. In particular, any point on the equator between plus y and minus y. But our iterative algorithm will still produce one of those points. And that's really the best we could ask for if we're asking only for a single point to represent the mean. This same algorithm, by the way, can be used to compute averages not just on surfaces, but in any kind of manifold. For instance, computing averages of rotations, which shows up in a lot of applications. To really talk about that, we need to understand what the exponential map and the log map mean for rotations, which is really the starting point for a topic of Lie groups and Lie algebras. But that's a story for another day. Okay, so the takeaway from this whole discussion is that we turned this problem of averaging points on a curved surface into a at least iterative linear averaging procedure by working in the tangent space, by working with the log map and the exponential map. Just so you can see what this looks like, here's a few nice examples of computing the Karcher mean. So we have orange points this time, and we're trying to find their mean. And the curve on the surface is 
just showing the iterations of this algorithm. So again, we start at some random point, a little blue dot. We figure out what direction seems to take us toward the center of the points. We walk along that direction using the exponential map. We estimate this direction at our new point and repeat until we converge. And so on the sphere, for instance, we get smack in the middle of those five points. Okay, maybe not such a hard example, but what you notice is for these more interesting shapes, the ear and especially these proteins, it's pretty clear that just taking a Euclidean average and projecting it onto whatever happens to be the closest point on the surface is not always gonna give us a good notion of average, right? We could end up at a point on the surface that's very, very far away in geodesic distance if we're not careful. Okay, so what we haven't said so far is actually how to evaluate the exponential map and the logarithmic map for a discrete surface. How do we actually run this algorithm? Well, the exponential map is actually really easy to evaluate. What do we do? Given a point P and a vector U, we're just gonna start walking along the direction U, along the surface. More precisely, at any moment, we are sitting inside some triangle and we can intersect the ray in the direction U with the edges of the triangle. Wherever it hits is our next point, okay? And we can read off the angle at that intersected edge, and we're gonna continue in the next triangle with the same angle. So actually, in the end, what we really end up doing is we kind of end up walking along a sequence of triangles that can be unfolded flat into the plane and tracing out a straight line in that sequence of unfolded triangles. If we take those triangles and fold them back up onto the surface, we get our discrete geodesic. In practice, we don't actually have to do this unfolding and folding, but conceptually that's what's going on, okay? The one little detail that we may have to worry about is, what do we do if we hit a vertex? Well, we just take our definition of discrete straightest geodesics and say, we'll continue in the direction that makes equal angles on either side. All right, pretty simple procedure, but we should ask a couple basic questions about its behavior. So one interesting question is, how big is the injectivity radius? So if we imagine starting out at a vertex I and traveling in all directions, how quickly do we end up hitting some point where we lose injectivity, where the wavefront crashes into itself? Actually, on most discrete surfaces, it doesn't take very long at all. It's just the distance to the closest cone vertex, the closest vertex where the angle sum is less than 2 pi. Why is that? Well, we said that these geodesics are going to go around the cone in two different ways and run into themselves. Okay, So on a discrete surface, the injectivity radius is really, really small. Actually, we knew that already because the cut locus contains every positive vertex of the surface. Also, is the discrete exponential map surjective? Can we reach every point of the surface by walking straight along geodesics from some source point? That was true for nice smooth surfaces. Well, for our discrete surfaces, something goes wrong again, which is that we can have saddle vertices, vertices where the angle sum is greater than 2 pi, right? And here, if I shoot out all these geodesics toward that saddle vertex, there's going to be this little piece of overlap that gets missed that we don't hit, right? So just like our notion of discrete geodesics based on this shortest property, this starting point of straightest geodesics also doesn't work out perfectly. As we've seen over and over again in discrete differential geometry, there's kind of no free lunch. There's a set of properties we'd like to have. There's a bunch of different discrete definitions, and we can't get them all at the same time. But different definitions are useful, as we've seen, for different tasks. Here's just some nice examples showing what the discrete exponential map looks like. Okay, so I start out at some point in some random direction. I start tracing out this geodesic, and I get this 
interesting curve that winds back and forth across the surface, but if I zoom in at that curve at any point, it's really quite nice and straight. A really nice thing about working with discrete surfaces is, well, we don't have to assume that the geometry is smooth. When you do classical differential geometry, and you want to talk about geodesics, you have to take all sorts of derivatives to set up certain equations. We'll actually see that in a few minutes. And it's tough to talk about things like this gear that have sharp edges and sharp vertices and so forth. So in fact, we get an exponential map and a notion of geodesics that's quite general and quite useful. Now, if we want to run our averaging algorithm, there's still one important piece missing, which is how to compute the log map. And actually, I'm not going to go into that today, but there's a very interesting story about the log map and a really nice algorithm that, in fact, came out of this class. So a TA for the class and a student in this class uh, got together after the class was over with me, and we wrote the paper that's referenced at the bottom. And we may get to look at that a bit more when we start talking about algorithms for computing geodesic distance. Okay, so the final perspective we want to look at when talking about geodesics and discrete geodesics is the more dynamic perspective or kind of physical perspective. So the idea here is that a geodesic can be thought of as a curve that has zero tangential acceleration. What do I mean by tangential acceleration? Well, let's consider, once again, a curve gamma in a surface M. The tangential velocity is just the tangent to the curve. It's just the time derivative of the curve. And the tangential acceleration should be something like the change in the tangent, right? Maybe the second time derivative of the curve. But there's a problem, which is that the change in the tangent over time is not itself a tangent vector. Right? I'm moving from one point on the surface to another. The change in the tangent could have a normal component. Another way of saying this is that intrinsically, tangents belong to different vector spaces. So if I go and try to define the derivative as a limit of the difference between tangent vectors, then I'm taking the difference of vectors that live in different vector spaces, in different tangent spaces. And this, this simply doesn't work. So this motivates a very important question, which is how do we measure acceleration of curves in manifolds or on curved surfaces? Okay. So the answer is given by something called the covariant derivative, which confusingly is denoted by nabla, just like several other operators like the gradient and the divergence and so on. Okay. So the covariant derivative of NABLA provides another characterization of geodesics. Put quite simply, it says, if I have my curve gamma on a surface, I'm going to ask that the covariant derivative of the velocity of the curve in the direction of the velocity of the curve is equal to zero. So the intuition here is there should be no in-plane turning as we move along the curve, right? There should only be bending due to the fact that we're stuck on the surface. How do we actually define this covariant derivative? What does it mean? So one way to look at it is from an extrinsic point of view, meaning we think about the surface sitting in space and all of our quantities existing in three-dimensional space. So just for the moment, let's forget about our question about geodesics and just say, in general, suppose we want to measure how fast a vector field y is changing along another vector field x at a point p. How can we do this? Well, we can take any curve gamma that passes through p and whose tangent is equal to x at p. Then we take our other vector field y and we restrict it to the curve gamma. So we only care about what y looks like along gamma, okay? Then if we take the ordinary derivative of y along the curve 
gamma, if we just do dy dt, then we're effectively getting the change of y along the direction x, at least at the point p. This gives us a vector that can have a normal component, but the covariant derivative is really just going to measure what is the tangential change. So we want to take this derivative dy dt and remove the normal component. The result is what we call the covariant derivative, nabla sub x y, meaning the change of y along x. If this sounds a little bit familiar, well that's because it's really not so different from how we define geodesic curvature. Right? We said geodesic curvature is the change of the tangent of the curve as we move along the curve, and we only keep the change in the direction of the binormal. Okay? And that kind of explains where this geodesic equation comes from. Nabla sub gamma dot gamma dot is equal to zero. Okay? Forgetting all the details, the key idea of the covariant derivative is that it tells you how quickly one vector field is changing along another. Okay, so that's the extrinsic point of view. I'm now going to do something that's a little bit different from what we have usually been doing in this class. So remember when we introduced smooth surfaces, I said there are lots of different languages for talking about surfaces, and learning to speak these different languages can help you understand things from different points of view and can help connect your understanding to a lot of what's written by different people speaking different languages. So, so far we've been talking extrinsically a lot. I've been really emphasizing visual intuition. But the reality is that a lot of time when you're working in differential geometry, you do computations in coordinates involving the metric G. So you have only knowledge of what does the inner product between tangent vectors look like. And from that, you try to infer things about the geometry. In fact, this point of view is quite powerful. It was a major development in the history of differential geometry to not have to always think about how is this surface, how is this space embedded into Euclidean space. It's really nice to not have to worry about that and still be able to get all sorts of interesting information out about the space you're studying. So let's do that for the covariant derivative. In particular, let's say that we have any function phi and we have any tangent vector fields x, y, and z. Then the covariant derivative nabla is uniquely determined by a set of pretty straightforward properties. So first of all, just like any other derivative, the covariant derivative is linear. In this case, that means that the derivative along z of x plus y is the same as the derivative of x along z plus the derivative of y along z. If I take the derivative along the sum of two vector fields x plus y, that's the same as taking the derivative along x and then along y and then adding up the results. And finally, if I multiply x by phi, so I speed up or slow down the rate at which I'm moving to take this derivative, then I get a derivative that's just increased or decreased in magnitude by that same amount phi. Okay? Also like any other derivative, the covariant derivative has a product rule. So in particular, if I take the derivative of a scalar function phi times a vector field y along a vector field x, that's the same as just taking the directional derivative of the scalar function along x and multiplying that function by y plus the function phi times the covariant derivative of y along x. Beyond that, there are some properties that link the covariant derivative to the geometry of the domain. So first of all, it's compatible with the metric, meaning that if I first take the inner product between two vector fields, g of x, y, and then see how that quantity changes as I move along the direction z, that's the same as taking the inner product between the covariant derivative of x along z with y and the covariant derivative of y along z with x.
okay? And finally, we say that the covariant derivative is torsion-free, meaning if we look at the difference between how y changes along x and x changes along y, that's given by something called the Lie bracket, the Lie bracket of vector fields. So what does that mean? So the Lie bracket, bracket of xy, measures the failure of flows along the two vector fields x and y to commute. So to get a sense of what that means, let's say we have these two vector fields x and y. Starting at some point p, we're going to follow x for time tau greater than zero, some short time. Then we're going to follow y, then we're going to follow minus x, then we're going to follow minus y to arrive at some point q. Each time going for a duration tau. The difference between q and p describes some failure of these flows to commute. And actually what you're really going to do is consider smaller and smaller times tau and take the limit of this vector divided by tau. The limit as time goes to zero. If we write this out in local coordinates, we can express the Lie bracket in this way. So the Lie bracket of x and y is equal to the sum over the components of x j times the derivative of yi along the jth direction minus yj times the derivative of xy along the jth direction times the basis vector field in the ith direction. Okay, better to keep the picture in mind here. What does it mean? It's this local failure to commute. Okay, all right, so those properties uniquely pin down the covariant derivative, but they don't give us a very explicit expression for it. They don't tell us how to actually take a derivative of one vector field along another. So I claim, not very controversial, that the covariant derivative is actually uniquely determined by the Ramanian metric, and moreover, we can use the metric to get our hands on a very explicit expression for how to take this derivative. Okay, in particular, if we have three vector fields u, v, and w, then just going through the properties of the covariant derivative, we have that the directional derivative of the inner product of v and w along the direction u is by the product rule equal to the inner product of nabla u, v with w and v with nabla u, w, and similarly for the other two directions. I can take the inner product of w and u and differentiate along v and so forth. Okay, if we remember that the metric, it's an inner product, so it's symmetric and it's bilinear. So we know that adding 1, 2, and 3 and subtracting 3 gives us, well, let's see. So we take these three terms that we have above, we add the first two, we subtract the third one, we expand the definition, and we also plug in our definition of the Lie bracket to simplify a little bit. Okay. Taking this further, expanding these terms, we get 2g times the inner product, uh, sorry, just 2g of nabla vu with w, plus the inner product of the Lie bracket of uv with w, plus the inner product of the Lie bracket of vw with u, plus the inner product of the Lie bracket of uw with v. Okay. Hence, we find that the inner product of the covariant derivative of any vector field u along a vector field v with the vector field w can be expressed in terms of this long expression on the right. Now, nobody should be looking at these equations and think, oh yeah, I clearly see the picture of what's going on here. The point here is not to have any kind of geometric intuition at all, but rather to take advantage of the power of more abstract algebraic manipulation. In this case, the only thing we care about is, well, we were able to isolate the covariant derivative on the left-hand side. And since the matrix G, the inner product matrix, or the Ramanian metric, is invertible, we can solve this equation to get the covariant derivative in terms of data that we know, in terms of the Ramanian metric. So we can work out explicitly how to take these derivatives on any surface or any manifold.
we're actually going to encode the solution to this equation in something called the Christoffel symbols. Okay, so let's say that we have a set of basis vector fields, x1 through xn. Right in the plane, maybe we just have vector field going to the right and vector field going up, unit vector fields. Then the Christoffel symbols are going to tell us how to differentiate one basis along another. They say that the covariant derivative of the ith basis vector field along the jth one is equal to gamma superscript k subscript ij times x subscript k. Okay, one thing to keep in mind here is that we are using Einstein summation notation. So whenever we see repeated indices above and below, we sum over all possible values of those indices. In this case, let's say for surfaces, k is going to range from 1 to 2. Okay, the point here is that we can write down this derivative as just a linear combination. And these Christoffel symbols are the coefficients of that linear combination. Okay, by linearity, if we know how to do this for the basis vector fields, then we know how to do it for any vector fields. Right? So recall on the last slide, we had this long, ugly expression that we said we were going to solve to get the covariant derivative. Since the Lie bracket of any two coordinate vector fields is zero, why is that true? Okay, if we just go to the right a little bit, then up, then to the left, and then back down, we end up where we started. Okay, so we can use that to simplify, and we get that twice the inner product of the ith basis along the kth basis with the jth basis is equal to a sum of directional derivatives of inner products of vector fields. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. In terms of the Christoffel symbols, we can write the left-hand side now because we've just written derivatives of basis vector fields along other basis vector fields. So we can make the substitution using the formula at the very top to get this expression, right? Same expression, but now using Christoffel symbols. We can write the right-hand side as just components of the metric differentiated along different directions. So this comma i means we differentiate along the ith direction. The other two indices, let's say kj, mean that component of the inner product matrix. Okay, and if we now solve this equation for the Christoffel symbols, we get this expression. Gamma superscript p subscript i k is equal to one half g superscript pj, meaning the pjth component of the inverse of g, times, well, the sum and difference of some components of the metric differentiated along different basis vector fields. Okay, yet again, nothing should be intuitive here. The point here is not so much that we got some deep geometric intuition for what's going on, but that if we actually have an expression for the inner product, g, for the Ramanian metric, then without too much effort, we can also write down an explicit expression for the covariant derivative. Which means if we just need to numerically evaluate these quantities, we can just plug it in. We have some scalar functions to evaluate. Not so hard. Okay, Let's actually do something useful with this. Let's see that all of this really kind of ugly equations pay off and let us do something interesting. So we can now use the Christoffel symbols to numerically compute geodesics on smooth surfaces. So far we've been drawing geodesics on discrete surfaces, but let's do it on smooth surfaces. So given a smooth surface F, which takes some region of the plane into space, right, a parameterized surface, we can easily write out the Jacobian. So remember the Jacobian or the differential is going to take tangent vectors in the domain and push them forward to the corresponding tangent vectors on the surface. Well, we can compute the Jacobian by just taking partial derivatives of f with respect to the coordinate directions in the plane. The Riemannian metric G is then represented by a matrix J transpose J. And we also want to write down the inverse of this matrix, which we'll again denote using superscripts rather than subscripts. Okay, using that data, we can now write out the Christoffel symbols using the 
formula that we derived. And using the Christoffel symbols, we can express the geodesic equation. So we said that a curve gamma is geodesic if the covariant derivative of its velocity along its velocity is equal to zero. Well, we just plug in the relationship that says, how do we write down the covariant derivative using Christoffel symbols? And we get another version of the geodesic equation, but one that's much more explicit. In particular, in this form, we can just plug this equation now into some standard numerical integrator like forward Euler or Runge-Kutta to step some initial position and direction forward in time to trace out a geodesic. Okay, and if we do this, we get a curve that looks like this, at least for some particular choice of surface F. Now, this seems weird. This doesn't look like a geodesic at all. Isn't a geodesic a straight line? Well, the point is, this curve is the geodesic in a local parameterization. To really see what this curve looks like, we have to map it forward by F. If we do that, then we get a curve like this. We get this beautiful geodesic moving along our smooth surface. Okay? So, pretty cool. So what we've seen today is that we actually have two different ways to solve our initial value problem for a geodesic, right? We want to trace out a geodesic along a smooth surface. What can we do? Well, one thing we could do is we could discretize the surface itself. We could triangulate the smooth surface, and then we could trace rays along the discrete surface. There's some complexity here. We have to think carefully about what to do if we hit a vertex and so forth. But the algorithm is pretty straightforward once we have the triangulation. On the other hand, we could do as we just did and write out everything in terms of Christoffel symbols, so write the metric in terms of F, write the Christoffel symbols in terms of G, and then solve our geodesic equation using an ODE solver. Okay, two different ways to do this. What are the pros and cons? There are plenty of different things you could think about here. You know, you might think about trade-offs in terms of accuracy or speed or memory or simplicity and, you know, various subjective opinions about those things. But I would say one thing that's definitely nice about the discrete approach is it's more general, right? We can compute geodesics easily on surfaces that are both smooth and discrete. If we just do this with Christoffel symbols, well, we run into problems as soon as we start differentiating or trying to differentiate the surface that's not differentiable, okay? So there really is something to be gained here from the discrete point of view. Of course, understanding the links to the classical view and understanding how people talk about that is also extremely important. Okay, to summarize, the main idea today was that geodesics in the smooth setting have several equivalent characterizations. In particular, we talked a lot about the idea of them being locally shortest and the connection to harmonic functions and the idea of being straightest and the connection to zero curvature or zero acceleration. When we go to the discrete setting, as often happens, these two equivalent characterizations from the smooth setting all of a sudden disagree. Right? So a shortest geodesic can't go through a vertex, a straightest one, well, we have a definition at least that allows us to go through a vertex. Shortest geodesics are natural when we want to solve a boundary value problem, meaning we know two points and we want to find a geodesic between them. Straightest is natural for an initial value problem. We have a point and a direction and we want to trace out the geodesic like we did for our exponential map. Interestingly enough, on a convex polyhedron, shortest paths are always straightest, but straightest paths are not always shortest. On a non-convex polyhedron, shortest paths may not even be straightest. Think about what happens when a path goes through a saddle vertex. Neither of these definitions faithfully capture all of the smooth behavior that we care about. This idea of shortest geodesics has funky behavior when you look at the cut locus or the medial axis. For instance, they touch every convex vertex or every boundary vertex. The straightest definition has an exponential map that breaks down in ways that are not expected. For instance, it might not be surjective. The point, as always, is 
that having many different perspectives on these problems allow you to pick the right tool for the job, allow you to pick the, the tool that's most useful for the algorithm or task you're considering, and also gives you the perspective to look for other possible definitions. All right, that's it for geodesics. Talk to you next time.